story. We are being recorded. Um, anyway, Melva Watts is a relatively new member, but she's been here longer than, we've got a lot of new members right now. And this is our chance to spotlight her and let her tell her story. Melva has a relationship that she's had for a lifetime with music. So we're gonna hear about it. And feel free to ask questions or make comments. Can we just do that as we oh, go? Yeah, sure. yeah, I encourage you to do so. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we can save it to the end. Or no, we can do it we'll as, we, as we go. So it'll be more like a conversation with Melva. All right, so thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And I really do encourage you to just say, hey, what is that? What do you mean? Because <laughs> I like to talk and, you know, I could get going. <laughs> And then you guys will say, hey, wait. So please feel free. We have a hook right over here. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> anyway, um, I was ex I've been exposed to music all my life because by default, actually. And I'm not especially talented. You know how you see virtual, so not, not me, I'm just a regular person. So I but how how many of you music you think means a lot to you? Are you in music at yeah. almost all people? And you know, when I think about it, I think, you know, I'm glad whoever created this universe put music in it. Yeah. You know, trees and rivers and streams, but also rhythms and music because it just it makes me feel so good. But at any rate, um I started out early. My parents uh, had three daughters in a row. I was a third. So they, my one daughter came, the next year another daughter came, then three years later, another daughter, which was me. And so I wasn't with them because I was three years younger, you know, but they were examples for me to know, like, don't do that because they got in trouble. <laughs> you can't do that because that worked well. And my parents, I grew up in Topeka, Kansas, and they both grew up on farms. And you know that painting where you see the man and the woman in yeah. the fish? The, yeah. um, I had a glass of wine. Pitchfork. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of my parents. You know, they didn't pay, you know, you didn't get any extra <laughs> special attention. <laughs> you just had to kind of figure stuff out for yourself. But I had these two older sisters. And so um, they started piano lessons. And I said, oh, God, I want to play the piano because they do. So I think like it was kindergarten or first grade, I had my first piano lesson. And I went and I learned this song and it was, here we go up the road to a birthday party. <laughs> I came home and played that song. I thought, like my sister, I can play piano. <laughs> I was so impressed that I could play this piano. But, you know, I was a very average student. I didn't believe in practicing because, <laughs> after all, when you're going to have a test at school, you study the night before, right? <laughs> and then you go, so I figured if I rehearsed the night before my piano, <laughs> I'd be okay. Well, not so. I got a lot of us too. <laughs> But I was so fortunate to have this excellent piano player. I took piano lessons until I was a senior in high school without really, I mean, not really giving it my all, but, you know, enough. And this lady, she was so patient. I know how to read music. I know all the classical composers. She just sat there and taught me everything. You know, and I was disciplined enough to listen to her, but not to practice. And so uh, I remember one time I heard I overheard her talking to my mom. And she says, Lorna, that's the oldest sister, she's very, very talented, which she was. And Kathy works really hard. And Melva, well Melva's cute. <laughs> it was my cool. <laughs> Not enough for me to practice, but I was kind of a clue that I wasn't like top tier. <laughs> but she worked with me and I learned and I retained all this stuff. I read music really well and have a really deep appreciation, you know, for classical music. And 
which she used a series of music books called the John Thompson. I don't know if you remember that. Well, it was one through five, one at the beginning, five is all that dance. And they would take classical music and just reduce it to a melody so you could play it. Oh, and nice. one example I think of is uh, Mozart's Minuet in G. You remember them? <laughs> okay, well, you know, when you, when they play an orchestra, it's all fancy. But you could play that on the piano. And so we could learn a lot of the melodies from the classical yes. music. I think I got to three. In the twelve years, I took music, music. Uh, but you know, I I just I don't know. I was interested in clothes and all kinds of other things. You know, music was just kind of in the background. But anyway, and every year she gave an annual piano recital, so you had to have a piece and you had to memorize it, and then you the parents come and you get up there and play your song. Sometimes I did it well, sometimes I didn't. But she said, you never seem upset when you make a mistake. I said, oh, no. <laughs> I don't under, I don't know. I just, I think I was off in another world or something. Oh, God, I made a mistake. Let's just keep on going. But anyway, I got through all those years. <laughs> okay. And you were cute. <laughs> yeah, and it's not too late to do books uh, four and four. <laughs> I think so. My brain is not connected to my fingers anymore. <laughs> I'm trying to talk, that's like, what? But, you know, uh, I went for a lot of years and didn't play. When I sat down and tried to play, I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember the book or the flats. And, you know, it just, it wasn't there. <laughs> So I do know that, you know, when I was taking lessons, I practiced enough that, you know, I, you can, you, they talk about memory, muscle memory, yeah. Yeah. you know, enough that, that I could play enough to do these recitals and whatever. Okay, but anyway, so that's the end of my piano career. <laughs> okay, so, but in addition to that, my family belonged to a Baptist church there in Topeka. Kind of a small black Baptist church, about 300 members. And we had to go every Sunday because, you know, we were good Christians. I mean, my parents were. <laughs> so, and, but what we did, we sang in the children's choir. And so, so I sang all this time in the choir. It was just something you did. I didn't think anything about it one way or the other, but I, I was singing all these years. And I remember one time when I was maybe fourth grade. Let, let me go back. This was a, it wasn't the kind of church you see on television, okay, with these big choirs and ladies playing. No. This was a small church, not a lot of talent, <laughs> but uh, they would hire a professional choir director, music director. And we had a lady that I thought was quite good, but she didn't have a lot to work with, <laughs> all these people in the bar, you know. And we were low key, you know, we, we wasn't doing a lot of gospel, we sang hymns. And um, it, it just was not, it wasn't the stereotypical Black Baptist church that you probably think of, it was just a little church. But we had this director who really worked with us and we would, one time she asked me to do the solo. <laughs> what? But you know, she asked me and I did it. And it was this song. I shouldn't try to sing now, but it, it started out. I hear the robins singing in the rain. And it was like, I didn't sound good <laughs> to me. But you know, I did the solo. And I remember my sister came to me, she says, oh, you did the best I did. You know, because I don't have that good of a voice. I like to sing, but I don't have, you know, a solo voice. But at any rate, that kind of got me to thinking, but not enough to say I'm a singer. I mean, I knew that I was, but I remember that solo. And um, it kind of gave me a little bit of encouragement as far as singing was concerned. You know what I mean? But anyhow, um, like I said, I took lessons. Okay. Another interesting thing, I sang in a trio with my two sisters, and I was second soprano, we had first soprano, second soprano, alto. And I think I learned a lot about 
harmonizing and learning songs. And to this day, harmony is my most favorite thing about music. When you hear those four parts and you hear that bass drum, we didn't have a bass support, but you know, and the voices blend really well. I mean, that, that's something that I think I learned to enjoy as a result of singing with my sister. And they would invite us to like uh, afternoon ladies teas, you know. <laughs> you know, come to uh, Reverend Sonso's having this anniversary. We'd like for you girls to sing. And we were nice girls. You know, we had that reputation. We were like, these are nice girls. Okay, so we would go girl. sing, right? <laughs> so I did that a lot. And I didn't, and see, my oldest sister, Lorna, was talented. She could play, she could sing. My second sister, Kathy, was a hard worker. I didn't have either one of those traits, but, you know, I was able to keep up was able to go on So I w was able to do what I had to do to, to sing in a trio with the two of them. I think they kind of dragged me along. The younger sister, they don't expect much from my younger sister, right? <laughs> <I'm not laughs> so anyway, but that was really helpful for me. But anyway, um, then let's see. So high school, you know, the we're still singing in the church. Then here comes Motown in the 60s. What? I mean, I love Motown. Why the rhythms, the beat, you know, the harmonies, the precision of the singers, you know, the, the feeling, the songs. And it was like, I didn't, and I'm not that I didn't like music before, but somehow this was just, just and it still does to this day, this was something that, that just grasped me. Not to mention, we would have parties, if we could find a family that the parents knew to stay out of the way, we could go to the basement, lower the lights, put on the records, and dance. Do you remember swing dancing? Where you held hands and, you know. I mean, that was just the greatest thing. But I I just, I the rhythms, I think, and I, I, I think rhythms is important to everybody, all of those who like, you like the beat, you like the rhythm. And here comes Motown with this dynamic rhythm, you know, and it was just like, this is wonderful. But you know, what's so interesting, I don't know if it was the same time, but you know, it's like, there was Elvis Presley, there were the Beatles, but I didn't pay them any attention. And what happened was in Topeka, the music was still separated, Black music and white music. And Beatles and Elvis was in the white music. White music. Well, I'm not paying any attention. I'm just listening to Motown. Although I'm not sure they're quite the same time, but I know that that was, I know I didn't pay any attention to the Beatles and any attention to Elvis Presley. But to hear Black music in Topeka, it wasn't on the radio stations. So you had to try to find a Kansas City. Kansas City was a little more sophisticated station who played Black music. And it was called KPRS, Colored People's Radio Station. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> KPRS, you know, oh, yeah, I think we got a signal. And, um, you know, that was what we did to listen to music. And it wasn't until I got older that I really appreciated the talent of the Beatles <laughs> and of Elvis Presley, you know, when I got and I said, oh God, they, they were good, weren't they? And I wasn't paying any attention when they had the big, you know, when they were they were really big. It was like, well, so what? Anyway, uh my favorite in the Tim in the Motown sound was Marvin Gaye, <laughs> The Temptations, Gladys Knight. The, when, when I hear those soundtracks, I just want to get up and dance. I still do. And I go on YouTube and, you know, listen to them, you know, because I just still just love that kind of music. Sure, I do. <laughs> It's probably about like the way I dance. <laughs> and you know, people don't dance with that kind of where they hold hands and stuff. Now they just all do their own thing. And yeah. you know, it's not to me, it's not as much fun, but I'm not that good. They're at dancing a muck. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> so um I've kind of put my dancing days behind me. Now I'm doing good if I can walk. 
but I, I remember how it was much fun then. Okay, talked about that. That. You guys got to ask questions. I'm going pretty fast. Yeah. I'm interested in the, the separation in, in that you lived through between white and black music. Where would you find black records? Or you could go to the store. You know Woolworths, right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. you could go to, and they, they carried all of it, which is interesting. You could go in the store, and we would know of the records because, you know, we listen to yeah. cats. And Get the record, take it into a back room and listen to it. Yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, it's, oh, yeah. and then we buy it and take it home and play it. So we were able to get our copies, you know, of the black right. music. You just couldn't do anything. What do you mean? Uh, on the radio. They couldn't get anything. You couldn't get any, what? You couldn't, you couldn't get records from the artists that were out the harder to find. The R and B artists, the ones that were popular, yeah, in mm -hmm. the record store, but some of the ones mm -hmm. that were a little harder to find were really hard to find in small yeah. town. And we probably didn't know about it. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? We could hear them on radio. They didn't hear them on radio. Well, we could hear them, but so KPRS will play just the popular ones. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. I remember when I got to college, jazz became popular, and you know, Dizzy Gillespie and all that stuff. I didn't learn about that till college, but I'm not sure how we knew about it. I just knew about it from other kids. Couldn't the WLS? What's that? Yeah. No. no. They were nationwide. Uh, They're saying, well, I can get them in Kentucky. Oh, God. We didn't know about them. Because <laughs> I don't remember listening, listening to them. But I'm sure there are a lot that we just didn't know about. You know. Interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody comes okay. to the music that they love. Mm -hmm. And have, a lot has to do with what you grew up with, you know. And your accent. People that you knew. But I do, re do remember it being hard to hear it. You know what I'm saying? Because you couldn't always get the reception and that kind of thing. So we didn't have really easy access to it. But, um, you know, we may do with, with what we had. I remember that singing and stuff. Were there any like uh, young people that had singing groups or bands in your community? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What kind of music did you and your sisters sing? We sang mostly religious, religious so music. So you never developed into a, oh, a no, We were much too square. <laughs> I mean, we really were. We were white, you know, not white girls, but we wore white tops yeah. and navy blue skirts. Yeah. And we sang, you know, Good girl music. Yeah, exactly. and stuff we learned in church. Sure, mm -hmm. you know that that was basic. And a, a lot of the places where we sing were churches, so we were not do up. And we, I don't think we had the do up ability. <laughs> you know, I love that with you getting with the like the Shirelles and all yeah. that. That was not us. <laughs> not you. <laughs> I I know this one song he sang. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, I went to college right there in Topeka. They have a university there, and I sang in the choir, which was mostly classical, which, which was fine. It was an easy one hour of A. Plus, it was you know, it was fun to sing with them because it was an you know, organized group. And they sang mostly classical, too. Graduated from college, and I came to San Francisco. And I, I was a parent. My mother would call me every Sunday night to ask me if I'd taken my kids to church. <laughs> I had to decide, do I lie and say yes? <laughs> I, just, I decided to be honest. No, Mama, I didn't. You're raising heathens. That's what she was doing. <laughs> but I didn't. I, I had gone to church every Sunday my whole life. I was so sick of church. And I, you know, so I just, I'm free. I'm on my own. I'm not going. Plus, you work every day. You want a day when you don't have to get up and go anyplace. You know what I mean? So, but then. Um, You're heathen. <laughs> and, and Jesus loves you anyway. Oh, she didn't that much. <laughs> yeah, she didn't say that, but anyway, 
I, I, I didn't feel compelled. But, you know, after my kids got a little bigger, I found I missed going to church and mostly the singing. So I, uh, there's a church in San Francisco called Third Street Baptist Church. It's a Black Baptist church that is huge. And they say it's the biggest west of the Mississippi. I don't know if that's true, but they had this choir that was dynamite. And people from all over the Bay Area came to sing in this choir. And the director was a guy named Sir Jules Haywood. And he had studied over in Europe and he got his cert uh, serdom, whatever it is, he got knighted in Italy. That's where he got his title. Oh, wow. And he came, you know, he was back and he directed this choir and he was a wonderful director. He's not only talented, but he had this wonderful personality. And the choir was, you know, easy 100 people. And they were good. I mean, they sang classical, they sang rock. And because people came from all over, they had a lot of talent, they had a lot of Solos and and I was oh, I gotta join I gotta join I gotta get in this choir <laughs> and so I went and joined you know and I had to audition and luckily the guys picked the hymn I knew so I could sing it <laughs> and so I got into the choir and this choir toured all over the West Coast Seattle oh, DC oh LA God. we made records and I looked to see if I could find you know the big thirty three and a yeah, thirty yeah. I thought I still had it and I could bring it but. I must have, you know, given it away, or but I didn't still have it. But uh, we would sing like every Christmas, the Messiah, every Easter, the creation. And what he would do is when we gave our concerts is have hire the musicians, the soloists in the orchestra. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, I just love that choir. So I sang with them for a lot of years and it was from uh, fulfilling me, but he retired and, and it just, it didn't, it deteriorated because they just didn't have that kind of leadership. You know, mm -hmm. I think the director is really, you know, what can make or break a choir. But anyway, I did that for a while. Then I kind of like, then I moved to Pasadena, like around 2000. And I got to find the church with choir. Looked and looked. I wasn't listening to the minister or anything. It didn't matter what he said. <laughs> but I came up on Neighborhood Church. And it's a universalist, Unitarian Universalist so up on Orangeville. They've got the excellent wire. Yeah. yeah. And I could deal with Unitarianism, in fact, better than Baptist, because they say you believe what you want. Okay, you got me on that. <laughs> I can do that. So I joined, uh, joined the church, joined the choir. Then the choir, you know, it kind of had a reorganization. And they had this group called Pro Musica, Pasadena Pro Musica, which you guys may have heard of. And it was like an extension of the church because the guy who directed, he did the church and he did this too. So I sang in two choirs, but then the church decided under the new minister, that that was a drain on them financially to have this director doing all of this and they're paying a salary and we'd have rehearsal space and you have concert space and all that kind of stuff. So we split and now Pasadena Pro Musica is on their own, but I stayed with Pasadena Pro Musica versus staying with the church choir. I still am a member of the church but I couldn't do two choirs, it was just too demanding. They had these two directors who are very demanding because you know they want to be good. And so I chose pro music. And the reason I did is they give concerts every four years, just like the concerts we had at Third Baptist, where it's just top notch. You know, the directors, first of all, they work us to death. <laughs> You know, they practice you until you've got it. You go home and learn that it's in German. Oh, I don't speak German. And see, you got to get it. And you go home and you listen to your part and blah, blah, blah. So we give this concert four times a year. Just did our last one this past in June. And um, it is top notch. It's professional. It's good. And this director. And one thing about the directors, the same way with Sergio, they're, they're connected in the music community. 
So they know who's there, they know who's good, they know, you know, who they can get. And so this guy, uh, the head of our thing, he's, uh, what's his name, Scott Linfield is his name. You know, they sing like in Los Angeles Master Chorale, and, you know, and things like that. So they can get us the top people. And I just go along and I can try to sound out the German, which is good, so I can stay in the course. You know what I mean? Because I love these concerts. I mean, it's just like something that raises me up. And the thing that's so good about it is you watch the audience react mm -hmm. to you, you know? And this last one we did had a, it's mostly classical, but this director is trying to do more kinds of songs. And we did a song that had a lot of, a lot of percussion, a lot of rhythms, and the choir made animal noises. You sounded like we were in the jungle. And you saw the little kids sitting there who are usually bored, really lighting up, you know, and listening to what we were singing. So that kind of thing is really rewarding to, you know, when you see the audience come up and, you know, like re respond to what so they're doing. So music is saying? Your uh, neighborhood church. Oh, they, they do. do. They yeah. We practice there because, you know, we got a thing together. We could understand them not wanting to put our bill because yeah. they're short on money, we're yeah. short on money. So, uh, but we still rehearse there, we give our concert and we have a good relationship with them. But we're just in Well, I'm really glad you didn't take the piano approach to your singing. <laughs> when you said that Give the up. director really worked too hard, I mean, yeah, well, that wasn't piano. <laughs> no, right. Yeah. But I'm a little older. A little wiser. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you and you obviously found what really brings joy to you. And, you know, when you're young, you, at least I you, I didn't appreciate stuff. You know, you took, I took stuff for granted. Like this music teacher, I wish I could go tell her how important she was, the patience she had. You know, someone who, you know, was just an average student to teach me all and to sit there every week and just explain things to me. And, you know, and at this age, to remember that so yeah. well is beautiful. It really is. Do you find as you get older, your voice is still pretty strong? No. <laughs> Mm -hmm. My voice is is not, and you know this choir. It, I'll pass this around so you guys can look at this choir is uh, aging out. It's, it was really hard to get back together after COVID. Yeah, we used to have 60, 70 members. Now we have like thirty something. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I'm, I don't know what it is. A lot of competition, but it's it's like getting a lot of choirs didn't come back at all. Wow. But we're really trying. COVID changed so much. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't really think about it at the time. Mm -hmm. The effect was the long term effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I wanted to point out that, to my mind, I, I have music in my background. Mm -hmm. um, you, by far, sang the hardest part. Say that now? Yes, because the ear will always hear the melody. Mm -hmm. And if you're a little bit comfortable with music, mm -hmm. the ear will hear the ground, mm -hmm. which is the low, mm -hmm. uh, sort of the bottom of the harmonics. But to hit the harmonics mm -hmm. that a second has to sing is not easy. Because mm -hmm. I try to think in terms of the harmonics as I'm listening to something. Mm -hmm. What is the chord? What is the chord? What is the chord? Mm -hmm. And I, I struggle with it. Mm -hmm. So, because I, I played an instrument that was just a single, you know, mm -hmm. single musical line. So anyway, I wanted to point out for everybody's purposes, it's a hard part of the whole group. <laughs> and you know, I, I oh, wouldn't have known that. Most wouldn't, but that's the way I look at it from the standpoint of the harmony that the my work, my later graduate work and everything was sort of in, in uh, musicology. So it's like, what what did music of all cultures, not just Western music, but particularly the serious music of other cultures, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, the classical genres of, well, India, China, Japan, et cetera, has certain universal qualities that make people come to it, and what is it? And of course, that kind of gets into, well, mm -hmm. okay, is it harmonic? Mm -hmm. And not all cultures are harmonic, as we know, yeah. meaning yeah. it's a chord. Right. It's got complexity to it. 
Um, so that's one aspect of it. Um, but again, what does music mean to people? So as you talk, the other thing that strikes me all of a sudden is that uh, you're privileged in a way. I'm, I was privileged to be have music as a drawing point in life because uh, I think the only other thing like it is sports where, where you achieve so much from the, your group pressure because you have a belonging. You do in music. If you're an artist and a painter, you don't have a group effort to be with mm -hmm. you and keep upward. So, so the group is a great thing mm -hmm. in the sense that it's the motivator. So you mm -hmm. always go just another step, another step. And as you talk, that's so apparent in your mind. You know, yeah, it was pulling you. It it really did. Um, mm -hmm. um, how, in a sense, rare that is to get to be affiliated with some sort of genre that does that instead of something that where you're a loner and you and can't have that here. Really. Yeah, and like when I go to rehearsal, I don't want the uh, like people to uh, realize I don't know my part. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you know, yeah. you're going to go home and you, try to learn it. You know? Know. And you hear yourself, well, I didn't do as well as I want. And so it pushes you. And I think if you didn't have that kind of like, oh, I got to meet their standards too, then you might not have done as much. So yes. thank you, for, in a way, for pointing that out. I don't do it. I don't I'm know. wondering if it makes a difference now if you're saying that the, the choirs are having trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I went to school, we learned to do re do re me and we learned how to mm -hmm. do parts. Mm -hmm. I don't know that children have. I don't think they have music they in don't school have in the same way where they're singing and learning how to do string. Mm -hmm. To hear mm -hmm. harmony and to be part of it. And it is so important, you know, and it's like art, music, you know, those kind of, you know, they're having a hard mm -hmm. time funding it. <clears throat> And it's it's competing with all the new stuff they have. Oh yeah, you mm -hmm. know the first thing to get wiped out. It was mm -hmm. like a yeah, and yet they're that. they're learning that um, children that have music and art in their mm -hmm. education ultimately become better problem solvers in 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 through real life because mm -hmm. it it allows your brain to be creative. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're, everything is just rigid and scientific, mm -hmm. you don't have that. There's something about the creative mm -hmm. part of the brain that's really essential mm -hmm. in life skills and problem solving, especially. You know, Bob, it also, you're reminding me of how the feeling of playing in an orchestra, mm -hmm. which is similar to being in a choir, mm -hmm. of being surrounded by music mm -hmm. and the chords and everything is, I, as an adult now, see, I don't play in that kind of situation. I loved that feeling when I was younger. Did you? What did you play? I played the clarinet. Yeah, <laughs> but it was so fun to be in the middle of it. Is. Yeah, and, it, and everybody's, you know, um, I sing, but there's an orchestra many times, and to watch them is just fascinating. I like to go and just watch the music. You know, mm -hmm. they know what to do, and they're all doing it at the same time. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> And I go down and compliment them and say, you know, and they say, well, what you're doing is hard too. You know, so. Uh, what brought you to Pasadena? Well, um, I worked for, um, I worked in corporate. I, my last job was with Bank of America. I was in human resource. Bank of America merged with Nations Bank in North Carolina. Moved everything from San Francisco, North, North Carolina. Carolina. So, you know, they gave us a year of severance to find ourselves. And I found myself in Pasadena because I had relatives down here. My son was here and my grandkids were here and things. And so I thought also it'd be better, I could have a better, there's more job opportunities because it's so much bigger down here than it is up there. So I moved down here and ended up teaching like I could have done up there, but I just stayed down here. <laughs> Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you. What was your teacher? 
I was a math teacher. I was still a math teacher. You know, I've had to say music and music. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely going in here. So how did you hear about the village? I heard about it. I have a sister, Kathy, the alto, <laughs> <laughs> lives in Chicago. She lives in Hyde Park. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and she, she, told, she told me about it. Wow. And then I found out I had a good friend that I used to work with who was in Luna Creek, and she's on the state board, and she does a new state mm -hmm. newsletter. She says, oh, yeah, call him up. Here's her number. Call him, call him. And I did. And, you know, so she's really happy that it's something that worked for me because she's really enthusiastic about it, too. Well, tell her thank you from all of us. Okay, I will. And your sister, Kathy, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, guys. Well, so, yeah. This is absolutely wonderful, and this is why we do member connections. You know, every one of us has a story, yeah, and they're all interesting. Maybe yeah. not to you, but to the rest of the village. Yeah, but people's stories are the most interesting. I think they truly are. I love biographies and you know yeah. people's lives. Yeah. And, you know how they got to where they are. Am I wrong, or did Linda Stowart sing? In she did. And she sat right next to me. She was an auntie <laughs> also. She was going to be here today. She yeah, and she after she's one that didn't come back after the pandemic, but you know she was taking care of her husband. Sure, but she was. Well, there. people sort of afraid because singing was, you know, the choir was what the big spreader was in the Seattle area. And when you sing, you know, they say, yeah, yeah. So we didn't sing for about a year and a half. They met online, which I could not relate to. But then when we came back, we had to use masks. And this June concert was the first concert concert we did without a mask. Yeah. And people said we could understand your words so much better. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So, but you know, one of our bases got COVID. I don't know that he got it from us, but he got it. So when people know they get it, you know, they have to stay out for a while. So it's, yeah. it hasn't gone away. Yeah. You know, when you were talking, you reminded me of my youngest daughter who sang in, uh, she sang at All Saints mm -hmm. in the, the Pee Wee Choir, the little all mm -hmm. the way up, and then she sang at John Muir High School, mm -hmm. and she sang at St. Andrews in Scotland, and she went to college mm -hmm. there, but I remember as a teenager her saying to me, Mom, I know I'm not a good singer, I just love being part of the choir. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of what you said, yeah. Betty Ann, about you know, just being right immersed and you're part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so spiritual. You know, I, I can go in now and, you know, I mean, I'm feeling okay. And I get on YouTube and I bring up songs I like and it's, yeah. it's all better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you know, I don't sing. You don't want me to sing, and I don't play any instruments, but I love music, and it's very much mm -hmm. a part of my life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's very uplifting. And, you know, Sunday morning church for me is Monica's newsletter, mm -hmm. a good cup of coffee, and KUSC. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a religious experience of another kind. <laughs> Anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for sharing yourself with us, Melba. I love spotlighting members. That's wonderful. And you're a great story. That I yeah, I was was oh, and I should announce this. I haven't set a date yet, but there's going to be another food nanny at my house in July. So bring your stories, your music, your instruments. I'll be looking for you. Okay. Yeah. It'll be uh, around the campfire. All right, well, there's uh, wine and cucumber sandwiches and crackers, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, like, my college roommate's husband, who's my so 